see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. Hi, it's Edwin Rush from the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy, and today I'm here with Anita Novak, and thank you for joining me, Anita. Great to be here, Edwin. Thanks for inviting me. So what we're going to do uh, in this dialogue is uh, you've written a, uh, a PhD thesis on empathic action, and so what we wanted to do is uh, kind of go through that uh, thesis and kind of go through it kind of step by step. And maybe before we do that, you could maybe just introduce yourself a little bit and just say a little bit about yourself and, and your work. Sure. So I grew up in Montreal. My two younger sisters and uh, my parents, especially my mother, um, believed that we were all born healthy and um, that as a result, uh, we could give back. So for nine years in a row, we would go through our neighborhood and collect money for the Telethon of Stars, which was um, an organization that uh, once a year had a telethon uh, to raise money for the two children's hospitals. So I grew up um, in a family with a mom, especially my dad too, but my mom in particular, who um, just believed that uh, service and, and giving back was an important feature. And it wasn't until many years later that I realized what an impact those, um, you know, those evenings out collecting money and uh, giving the money away meant to me. Um, in fact, uh, when I started doing my PhD, I was doing a completely different uh, research project. I was looking at media education, uh, how to sort of teach uh, youth to read the media more critically and become competent media producers. And it wasn't until I took, um, uh, I, had, I had been offered a job. I was working in professional fundraising and uh, it was a big promotion for me and I said to my thesis supervisor, by then I'd already finished my comprehensive exams and I said, listen, I need a year sabbatical and he said, okay, but uh, come back and see me in six months because this is where everybody falls off and attrition is very high. So I went back to see him in the spring of 2008 and by then I was already planning a trip to Rwanda with my sister. We were going to do a needs assessment for a women's collective and start up a microcredit loans program for them. And I went to see him and we were just catching up, no big agenda. And he said, Anita, I don't think you found your calling. And I said, what? And he said, no, I don't think you found your topic for your PhD. I want you to go back home and I want you to go to that drawer or that uh, file or the box where you've been stuffing things randomly for years and you're not sure why and take a look what's there. And uh, at first I was a little upset saying, you know, how dare you tell me what my passion is. But finally I, I I did actually have a file called miscellaneous in my filing cabinet and I opened it up one day and spread all the newspaper clippings out and I realized what I'd never seen before, which was that I was very, very passionate about people who were trying to create change in the world. And there was um, a new field that was just blooming um, called social entrepreneurship and it was at that stage where I realized that I was very attracted to people who cared about the welfare of others and did something to help, you know, solve a problem. And so that's where my research orientation changed completely. And so I called my, my thesis a pedagogy of empathic action as informed by social entrepreneurs. So, you know, where I really come from, if you'll indulge me in one quote that I'll read, uh, just to situate what I care about and why this work is meaningful for me, um, it's, a, it's a quote by a woman uh, with a last name Burlak, B-E-R-L-A-K. In 1989, she wrote, I teach, I do research and write because I'm concerned about the future of life on this planet. And I want to play some part in the creation of a more humane, just, and joyful world. I pursue these activities as I do because I believe that in order for the society of the future to provide an environment in which life can survive and flourish, awareness, outrage, empathy, and a sense of empowerment must be more widely dispersed. So that just situates who I am. Um, since finishing my uh, degree last year, I've, um, I've taken on the role of integrating director of the Social Economy Initiative at uh, McGill University and their Faculty of Management which basically means I'm integrating social entrepreneurship into the curriculum, uh, into research agendas and outreach. So that's who I am in a nutshell. Okay, so it sounds like uh, you're, you kind of grew up in an empathic family that thought about 
you know, thought about society and thought about others and that you kind of connected that with your PhD thesis, that you kind of wanted to bring that, that uh, energy and that initiative into your PhD. And now you have this uh, uh, PhD in uh, thesis and we want to kind of go through it step by step to kind of explore kind of what you uh, came up uh, with and Sure. So let me frame the problem. Okay. Um, because a pedagogy of empathic action is essentially pedagogy that doesn't drill down into curriculum. It just sets parameters that um, teachers could use to contemplate how they're going to develop a curriculum for their classrooms. Um, and essentially the idea is to develop a pipeline of really engaged youth who uh, want to support social change and work towards um, improving the state of the world. So the problem that I see, and I start, when I teach my classes, I usually ask students this question. Um, well, I position it this way. I say, imagine you're um, a space alien and um, very quietly you show up on planet Earth and you're there to do some research about how we're doing on the planet. And this is what you see. Okay, through let's say a couple of months of, of uh, anthropo anthropology. You'd notice that um, one in six people in the world is undernourished. Okay, and over nine million children die every year under the age of five, and 80% of those deaths are completely preventable, but it's just that they're not getting the inoculations or the, or the drugs or medication that they need. And you would know that one billion people lack access to safe drinking water and over one billion people do not have sanitation facilities. So they're defecating outdoors and the global population is expected to exceed nine billion people by mid-century with more than half of humanity concentrated in urban areas. Okay, you'd also, if you were the space alien, realize that there are, there's so much forced labor and human trafficking right now that there's over $44 billion a year in this industry. It's the third largest underground industry after arms and the drug trade. And just to put that in context, we have about 27 million um, people in bonded labor or human trafficking, and that's three times the amount of um, people that were part of the, the African slave trade over 300 years, okay? So that's to put it in context. And we've got hundreds of thousands of kids right now that are currently serving as soldiers for rebel groups and government forces in armed conflicts, whereas there's 100 million kids not in school, 60% of those girls. And then another thing that a space alien would realize is that 94% um, of the world income goes to 40% of the population, which means that 60% of people live on just 6% of the world income, okay? I mean, it's, 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 it's appalling, the distribution of wealth, the inequality of that. And then half of the world population lives on $2 a day, over a billion on less than a dollar a day. And then you juxtapose that, uh, the 15th Annual World Wealth Report for 2011 says that there's 11 million millionaires on the planet and over 100,000 people who are super rich with assets of $30 million or more. And then lastly, you've got the climate crisis. You've got a system that, of an exchange of goods and services that is actually pillaging the earth and uh, wreaking havoc on the system that we sustain life. So if you were a space alien and you were you know, doing a diagnosis of how human beings are doing on the planet, you'd go back to wherever you came from and say, I think they're kind of they're like going off a cliff. Um, they, they're not doing a good job managing you know, their resources and um, distributing their resources in any kind of equitable way. So that's sort of the, the big ticket context that I think about, that there's a lot of issues in the world and problems in the world that we need to give attention to and that we can, if we put a little bit of time, energy, resources towards, we could actually change things. There needs to be political will. So that's, that's I guess, the first frame that I would want um, to put out there. And one of the uh, main arguments 
that I make is that education is actually one of those systems that could be used as um, like the early stage of change. I also ask my students, you know, 300 years ago, public education was created by man. It's a man-made creation. It didn't exist since the dawn of mankind. And I ask them, why did, why did education get established in the first place as, you know, as a public institution? And you know, they're, they're really curious because they have no idea and they've never really grappled with that question before. And, and then at some point, one of the students might say, oh, for jobs. And I'll say, yeah, exactly. 300 years ago, public education was created to serve the Industrial Revolution. But today, what is the purpose of education? Is it really to feed industry or is it perhaps to actually create capable individuals of critical thinking and problem solving? And so I'm coming at this whole issue from that perspective, that education is intended to develop people who are capable of solving some of the problems that face our, our society. Okay, so kind of what I was hearing there is that uh, you just, you're kind of laying out all these social problems that we have, like, you know, there's problem here, problem here, problem here. And you're saying that education is, can be kind of like the problem solving mechanism for starting to address some of these uh, problems. Yeah, because the institutions right now that exist, um, a lot of them are very, um, you know, some of them work in a functional way, but some of them are grossly dysfunctional. I mean, democracy as we know it right now is is under siege, right? In the United States, I mean, just the, the whole notion of the super PACs and how, what kind of change that's creating a, on your political system. I mean, there are major institutions that used to be extremely, extremely effective and are less effective. Um, a lot in large, in a, for, I believe a large part of that has to do with the growth of the capitalist mindset and how much that's infiltrated a lot of our systems. So education is one of those places where you can inculcate um, in, in children and youth critical thinking, creative problem solving, collaboration, and empathy. Okay, so, uh, and I, you're in, your PhD is also in the Department of uh, Education too, so you're kind of like an educator, so this is really your background. And That's right, mm -hmm. that's right. So, um, to give you an idea of, um, of what I did for my research, is that I interviewed social entrepreneurs uh, to inform my thinking about this pedagogy of empathic action, and why I chose social entrepreneurs is that they are really the poster children of empathic action. You know, if I look at any given social entrepreneur, what they have in common is they see a problem that affects people or groups or individuals or communities or the environment, and they recognize that people are suffering or some, some injustice is happening, and they care enough to do something about it. So they're engaged in empathic action. So I figured, you know, I mean, there's a lot of other individuals that do the same. Nurses engage in empathic action all the time, and social workers. But I chose social entrepreneurs because I think that there's a lot, a lot of potential in that social entrepreneur movement. Um, and that if we could get a critical mass of youth really turned on by social entrepreneurship and what the potential is, that you could have really um, mass change. So... Um, Yeah, so My, you're yeah you're you're. It sounds like you're you're kind of combining then education and the social entrepreneur, uh, and because you you seem to have a real passion for problem solving and you're wanting to solve problems, you're looking out there for what are the best ways for problem solving, uh, you know. And you're, it seems like you're thinking education and social entrepreneurs are kind of like an engine for uh, social. Uh, problem solving. And there's one thing too, is you mentioned change. Um, I always have a problem with that word change because it's like change for what, right. you know? So I'm kind of wondering how are you using the word change? Like what is, because there's, you know, Hitler had change, serious change, you know, Stalin had change, Mao had change, but it wasn't the kind of the change that kind of resonated with me. So how are you right. kind of seeing that quality of change, which is what you brought up well, that's interesting that you asked that question because the terminology I use is sustainable, positive social change, 
but all of those words can are loaded as well you know what does sustainable mean what does positive mean what does you know social mean what does change mean but essentially what i'm looking for is a greater equity spread where every human being is treated with the inherent dignity and and um and respect and rights that they deserve and unfortunately the way things are now you've got gross inequality so the social change that i'm interested in is about rectifying that inequality mm -hmm. okay so bringing more equality throughout the world society then that's right yeah okay so my doctoral work um, answered, you know, there's always research questions in every um, research project. So I asked the question, what is empathy? Um, I asked, what is empathic action? I asked, what group of individuals are already practicing empathic action? And then I, in terms of a research methodology, how might narrative inquiries uh, and interviews with these individuals inform a pedagogy of empathic action? And finally, what are the broad strokes of a pedagogy um, of empathic action? So those were essentially the, uh, the five questions that I answered. Okay, so what do you think is the best way? Going just go through step by step what uh, you came up with? Or how do you think is a good way to proceed, kind of explore this? Well, certainly I'll say that in my lit review of what is empathy, there's a raging debate that's been going on for hundreds of years, um, and it's been framed by a number of different people as far back as, you know, early Chinese philosopher uh, Mencius, uh, who talked about, you know, having sympathy for others. And, you know, you have Thomas Aquinas and David Hume and Adam Smith and Schopenhauer. A whole bunch of very, very famous philosophers have grappled with the issue of empathy. And the, the term empathy actually was a latecomer. So usually the words that were being used were pity and sympathy um, and sometimes compassion. And then it eventually the word empathy came onto the scene. And I'm sure uh, some of your own reading or some of your other interviewees must have um, explained how empathy as a word you know, came onto the scene. It was a German looking at aesthetics and how art invokes a feeling, and and that's how empathy, um, you know, came onto the scene. Kind of but got I, coined as a word. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it actually was coined as a word in German first, right? Yeah, Einfühlen. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So I have a very particular way of seeing those four words that are sometimes confused, pity, sympathy, compassion, and empathy. I put them on a continuum. And on one end is the pity side, and there's a very strong power differential. Whereas on the empathy side, the power differential disappears because you're on the same level playing field and you're seeing the common humanity in somebody. So I think empathy is distinctive from sympathy and compassion and pity because there is no differential. You treat every human being as an equal. That's really crucial to my research. So um, as the word empathy evolved, psychologists got very, very interested in empathy. And there was a very raging debate among the psychologists about whether empathy is something affective or something cognitive. And what they've come to realize over time is that it, it's actually both. It's not one or the other. That it is a feeling. You feel something when you're empathizing, but you're also thinking something. So the two happen in synergy. Um, beyond uh, psychology, the world of neuroscience has actually you know, informed us quite a bit about empathy. And I'm sure some of your other guests have spoken to the issue of mirror neurons and how that came to be um, discovered and what the implications of those are. I mean, do you, I don't think you need me to speak to that. As much as you want, speak about whatever you want, whatever, whatever, you know, speaks to you, speak about it because, uh, you know, it's tied all together. I... Sure. Okay. So, um, there was a group of, um, Italian researchers about 10 years ago that were doing um, research with bonobo apes. And they actually discovered mirror neurons by accident. Um, freak of science, but meant to be. 
um, this monkey, this bonobo ape was actually attached to an fMRI machine and during some downtime where the researchers were actually taking a break, one of the researchers came back into the lab and noticed that one of the bonobo apes was eating peanuts, I think it was, and the, the little bonobo ape that ha was attached to the machine was a witness to his friend eating the peanuts. But the way his brain was firing, it was as if he was eating them himself. So this researcher said, well, isn't that odd? So they replicated this a few times over, and then they've done it with other species and including humans. And they realized that we have mirror neurons where our brains light up in similar ways as if we were experiencing things versus just seeing it, which is really interesting because if you consider you know, people that you hang around with, if they're always toxic and they're always complaining and they're always bitching about something, <laughs> you're, you're internalizing that. So your brain is seriously lighting up as if it were experiencing whatever crappy situation they're talking about. But if you're around people who are, um, you know, generally more optimistic and have great stories of, you know, things they've seen or happy stories, your brain lives that as if it was ex you experiencing it. So the implications of that are super, super important in terms of how your brain, which is a plastic, you know, you, you hear a lot about brain plasticity now, you can change the quality of your thoughts and change the quality of your brain and experience by uh, exposing yourself over and over again to really good things. So try to stay away from news, which is always, you know, you know, bringing out the worst in people and seek out, you know, those Hallmark movies or, um, you know, ways that you can um, feel inspired because it actually changes your brain chemistry and your physiology. So I didn't want to mention one thing about that story about the, the uh, monkeys, the research. I've heard there's multiple there's multiple versions of it, and people kind of okay. argue about what the truth is. I even talked to Marco Iacoboni about it, and he's got his story. But the the story is actually that I heard it was with macaque monkeys, and they okay. actually and they don't mention this much because I think they actually had their brains open, and they had uh, actual probes on the individual um, neurons, motor neurons. So when the neuron would get an electrical impulse, it would set off an impulse because the fMRI is like kind of benign. So I think a lot of times okay. that research, it, it gets told in different ways because people don't want to say, well, we had their heads, you know, opened up and, <laughs> and neurons, you know, I mean, you know, so. Um, so anyway, that's just just kind of an, a, a, an aside. But I, I actually think you're right about the macaque mon monkeys because uh, I think I've made the mistake. It's Franz Duval who's done a lot of work with uh, bonobo apes, and he makes the claim that if 50 years ago anthropologists and primatologists had actually researched bonobo apes instead of chimpanzees, um, we would have a different impression of human nature because the chimpanzees have a lot of sort of like, you know, hierarchy and competitive nature, and there's, you know, certain elements of violence. Whereas the um, uh, bonobo apes are very, very collaborative and very um, sympathetic. So you're feeling like this was chapter two, that you're going through understanding empathy through a literature review. So uh, you went through all the, uh, the thesis, I mean, has like pages of all the different quotes of all the, of how the word was used. So you've really gone into real depth into kind of how, how the word was used. And the, the, the interesting part, I think, is this difference between empathy and pity and kind of seeing it as a continuum. So it's um, with pity, you know, it's a, it's a looking down, like, oh, you're suffering, poor you. And, um, you know, it, it has a very hierarchical difference. And, you know, the, it's seeing someone as kind of inferior then. And then you're going to sympathy and then compassion and then uh, empathy is, and how does that continuum? How do you kind of, you know, what does that continuum mean to you? How does that kind of change? Well, it, I, the reason I use a continuum is that the words are so similar 
But there are, for me, clear distinctions. And so I didn't want to get caught in this sort of tug of war between what's better, compassion or empathy, sympathy or compassion, sympathy or empathy, pity. So I just said to myself, well, I view empathy as one person recognizing another person's human light, you know, the, the common humanity between us. Whereas pity, like you said, has this sort of paternalistic attitude, right? Sort of the old philanthropy of, oh, those poor people, let's, you know, cut them a check. Whereas the further along you go, the more you realize they were just born, you know, in a different place and time. And, but there's no more value that I have versus who that person, what that, the value of the other person. So that's why, that's how I make the distinction. I noticed that the uh, cameras changed again. Yeah, it's kind of going. It's uh, the camera is switching between wide and narrow screen. But don't worry, I'll I'll kind of handle that. Okay. So um, in my dissertation, I lay out a sort of um, rather uh, complicated definition of empathy that I won't get into right right now. But just know that the way I view empathy is that it's a synergy of affect and cognition, and they work together. And it's, it happens very spontaneously, and it is really about seeing the common uh, denominator between people, and that we're all part of the human species. Yeah, it's, uh, I, really, I think it's a really important distinction because the word sympathy, as you mentioned, also gets used interchangeably with empathy, and it's a very different uh, phenomenon. The, the uh, sympathy tends to be like I, if I'm empathizing with you and you're doing something that's that you know maybe you're in fear that I become fearful or I become sorrow you know I, I, I feel sorrow for your uh, experience whereas the empathy is more like well it's it's a more like a oneness we are kind of one in this experience and it really informs the action the action that it, which you're kind of geared you know looking towards will be a different type of and a different quality Absolutely. Absolutely. So, okay. So, I just, uh, it was a little bit of an aside there. I just, because I, I really am interested in that, that, you know, those differences and we want to do a whole project on the definition. So I don't want to go into it too much, but you know, did touch, want to touch on it a little bit here. Sure. Okay. The uh, next was your next chapter was exploring social entrepreneurship uh, through a literature review. Is that, yeah. Okay. So I figured since not all of the readers would be familiar with the people that I did interviews with, or, the, you know, it's a new, it, it was a buzzword 10 years ago. It's kind of picked up steam in the last decade or so, but a lot of people still don't know what a social entrepreneur is. So let me make the distinction between a traditional entrepreneur and a social entrepreneur. So traditionally speaking, an entrepreneur takes some risk by establishing some venture that provides products or services for sale. And um, in exchange for the risk, they hope to make profit, right? So that's a traditional entrepreneur. A social entrepreneur also takes risks and also has the skills and talent and commitment like a traditional entrepreneur, but their goal isn't to make profit. Their goal is to create some kind of social change and to alleviate some kind of suffering. Now, in some instances, you could have social enterprises where they're making profit and the profit is being utilized in a social way. And so that fits within the ecosystem of social entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurial activities. But for me, social entrepreneurship, I really, there are two um, framings that, I, that I'll share with you. One is Roberts and Woods in 2005. They say, social entrepreneurship is the construction and valuation and pursuit of opportunities for transformative social change carried out by visionary, passionate, dedicated individuals. And then another quote is, it's a different way of doing things based on shared values. It is about a vision of the way people and organizations might work together for a common good where private gain is tempered always by consideration for the needs of people and the planet. And that's Pierce and Kay in 2003. So you see that there's you know, the individual who's got passion and vision and dedication to creating social change and that social entrepreneurs have a, they come at it from a different 
values perspective, which is about we can do better for more and find that common good. So um, that's how I would define social entrepreneurship. And, you know, I, I go into some, you know, the debates and the history of how it bloomed. But here are some good examples of social entrepreneurs. The, the, the oldest example that I have is Florence Nightingale, who developed the entire field of nursing. And she's a social innovator. And she said, you know, we have boys and men coming back from war and, you know, surgeons working on their wounds and, and fixing their problems and and how what's the space and the environment in which they convalesce isn't there a need for somebody to support the convalescent you know period and um that's how nursing you know got established right and now we couldn't even imagine what you know healthcare would look like without nurses so another more contemporary example would be Muhammad Yunus uh who is the inventor and you know I mean, real pioneer around microcredit loans where, you know, millions of people in poverty were lifted out of poverty because they didn't have access to collateral. They couldn't get a loan from the bank. Some of them didn't even have addresses. And yet microcredit loans provided the opportunity for them to borrow, let's say, $30. They had a collective agreement, you know, to pay that back. And it was their community that was, you know, supporting them. So they could buy a frying pan, you know, make some meals on, at the marketplace, and sell it and then slowly but surely repay the loan. And this just scaled. And millions of people have been lifted out of poverty through microcredit loans. So he's a very good example of a social entrepreneur. So some of the people that I interviewed, I'd be happy to, to tell you some stories about some of the great uh, social entrepreneurs I interviewed. Matt Flannery is um, sort of like uh, microcredit loans 2.0. Um, he co-founded Kiva.org. Are you familiar with Kiva? I've heard the name, but I'm not sure at all what they do. What they do. So using the power of the internet and the idea of loans at a very small level, it's a platform where people around the world, farmers, um, tradespeople, who would like to borrow some small funds just to get started, they post their story online and you can actually visit their site and either, you know, go by country, go by um, a sector, go by gender, go by all sorts of different ways that you can categorize the people that you can actually read about different individuals. So you're not donating to an organization per se, you're organizing, you're, you're donating to um, a human being. And in fact, you're not donating at all. You're providing a loan that does get paid back to you. And what they're seeing is that, you know, it started with a few hundred people and scaled to thousands. And now there's hundreds of thousands of people that are engaged across the planet in these microcredit loans one on one. And, uh, you know, Matt was telling me that a lot of people get such a high out of giving, you know, um, providing a loan that does get repaid that they inevitably lend money again. So the money still stays in the system. And most of the time, people just increase the amount of money that they're willing to lend to a number of different um, recipients. So that's a great example of social entrepreneurship. One that I care about and one that I'm sure you know about is Mary Gordon, Roots of Empathy. Um, she is an educator in Canada. Um, she spent 20 years in low social economic status schools for 20 years in Toronto. And she started to notice this trend. What was happening is, you know, it wouldn't happen necessarily every day, every week or every month, but she would see, let's say, a single mom bruised, um, clearly, you know, been knocked around at home, show up at school to provide a lunch bag or pick up a, you know, their daughter or son. And she would see this correlation between the behavior of the kid in the classroom and what she knew was happening at home, being exposed to violence. And she said, how am I going to break this intergenerational cycle of violence? And she said, I have to start with the really young kids and provide them a language of emotion, provide them tools that they can communicate effectively how they're feeling, and to really, you know, provide a space for empathy to grow. So she started this organization called Roots of Empathy. It's a fabulous little program. Once a month, a baby will be invited to a classroom. So let's say you're a Roots of Empathy school and you have 12 grades. 
at the beginning, in, sometime in the summer, a baby will be born in the community and they'll sign up to be a Roots of Empathy baby. Well, the baby won't sign up, but the parents will. And so every grade has age-appropriate curriculum and that baby, so one baby will be assigned to each grade level. And starting in September, the baby who's now three or four months old will come for the very first visit and then subsequent visits throughout the entire year. And the day before the visit and the day after the visit, there's curriculum that supports the actual visit. So this is, you know, not just sort of like a one-off. This is really very well planned, very mindful. And the baby shows up and the kids sit in a circle and the baby's placed on a green blanket and they have a conversation about what's the baby going through and how's the baby evolved? Why is the baby crying? What do you suppose the baby needs? And they develop the language of communicating emotions. So Mary tells the story about how it changes school culture and you know, in a world with a bullying crisis as it is, I mean, this is a very effective program where she's you know, been told stories by teachers across Canada, New Zealand, South Africa, Ireland. I mean, this is scaling in, a, in an incredible way that, you know, a kid, let's say in grade two, will go over to a classmate who's tying his shoe or her shoe and say, I see that you're struggling. That must be so frustrating. Can I provide some assistance? You know, and children are friendlier and more compassionate and more empathic with one another. So that's another really good example of a, um, a social entrepreneur. And I can give you one more example, um, and then we might move on, and, and that is uh, John Wood. Um, he's the founder of Room to Read. Do you, are you familiar with him? Mm, I haven't heard of that one, no. Okay. So he's actually been ranked one of the 30, 30 most, um, I guess, uh, effective social entrepreneurs in, in North America. So he's, um, he's an MBA grad, uh, total alpha male, uh, who worked for Microsoft for many years. And he actually um, was doing business development for Microsoft in Australia and then actually headed up, I think, what was at the time the 98, Windows 98 or Windows 99 launch in China. And, you know, he had Mr. Bill Gates himself coming for that launch. So it was high stress and, and lots of, um, you know, long days, I'm sure. And when it was finally over, he took vacation and he went to Nepal. And uh, he wanted to do some trekking in the Himalayas. And he met up with this Sherpa who was going to deliver some books on, in this, like, old-fashioned, um, what is the, the fabric of, you know, like a, like a heavy potato bag? What is that fabric? Burlap. Yeah, so this yak was carrying books, and um, John was invited to follow this gentleman up the mountain to visit the school, so he did. And what he witnessed is that the school, I mean, you couldn't even call it a school because it was like, uh, it had four walls and a roof, but, you know, no, what we would consider important supplies to teach. There weren't even a lot of chairs, and the books were actually locked up in a cabinet, and this stayed with him in a really big way. And he said, well, I'm going to make sure that, you, you know, this school gets some more books. So he went back to his job and he realized that, um, you know, over time he was sending emails to friends to collect books back home so that they would be shipped. And he was organizing that a whole shipment of books would, you know, get to Nepal. And he realized that he was more excited about that work than he was about his day job with Microsoft. And I'm not giving away any secrets because he actually wrote a book called Why I Left Microsoft to Change the World. Because he ultimately one day decided to, um, to leave Microsoft. And he, you know, flew to California. I think, I don't know where he's originally from, but he set up Room to Read in San Francisco. And now, 10 years later, it's built over 10,000 schools and libraries around the world. And... He's very, very interested in educating girls in particular because, you know, a lot of different organizations have recognized that once you educate a young girl, the ripple effect is amazing because fertility goes, um, or not so much fertility, but um, high rates of uh, child mortality and, you know, multiple births, you know, that improves, um, uh, obviously, education it normally leads to jobs and you know better health care for their families and it's generally a, a really really good investment 
So he's another um, fantastic example of a social entrepreneur that saw a problem and put some time and effort um, towards solving it. So I did interviews with 19 social entrepreneurs and um, they lasted on average about an hour. And I asked questions in generally like three, um, three areas. One is I wanted to get to know them as a human being and sort of a little history about who they are. So what kind of family they grew up in. And that's actually how I came to realize the value of the fundraising that I did as a child because I was not cognizant of that until this research, uh, until I massaged the, my research findings and realized that most social entrepreneurs, I think with one exception, and that's only because his family was actually a mafia family, but apart from him, all of the social entrepreneurs I interviewed had families that modeled behavior that is consistent with empathic action. So I think that that's a really crucial takeaway. So um, I asked about, you know, if they had any um, favorite uh, teachers or mentors or as they grew older, any favorite authors or philosophers, like just, you know, how did they spend their time, their money, their energy? And all of them, with that same exception, were good students. And all of them had families that modeled um, empathic behavior and um, service behavior. So then the second set of questions that I asked were very pragmatic about how their social organization got off the ground. And um, they had different stories. I mean, a lot of them talked about, you know, you'd better be super committed because the amount of time and energy that it takes is, you know, it will it won't go away. Like you have to really be passionate and married to your cause. Um, but there was a whole series of different examples of how things got started. Um, and then I talked about, you know, what kept them motivated and almost consistently it was site visits, visiting the people where the impact was clear. So it would be almost kind of reconnecting to the empathy of like, oh yeah, that's why I'm doing this. So I think that was really interesting. And then the, the final set of questions that I asked had to do with sort of more philosophical, where do you think social entrepreneurship is going? Uh, what have you learned from the process that you didn't expect to learn? But really, what do you think would motivate more young people to enter the world of social entrepreneurship and how could education play a role? And so, um, as a result of the, the interviews that I did, I actually put together a list of insights in terms of you know, how pedagogy could look differently or could be different um, based on my findings. So if you want, I can enumerate um, okay. some, yeah? So one of them, since we know that families modeled empathic action behavior, it would be important to get teachers to model empathic action behavior consistently throughout the school year. That's one thing. Um, educators should definitely make it um, uh, a regular habit to invite guest speakers into their classroom who are living examples of people who are working in service for others. That's another way. Um, educators should include as many outreach opportunities as possible in their um, curriculum where they can take, you know, go on field trips to organizations, nonprofit organizations that are doing good work so that kids are regularly coming into contact with the idea of service as a way of being in the world. Um, classroom discussions ought to really f um, focus on, on a regular basis about current affairs and social studies and geopolitics. There seems to be this, you know, emphasis on the three R's and the, you know, in the States, it's, what's that, uh, what's that term they use? The, no child left behind, mm -hmm. um, you know, this drive to success um, and all the, the, the kind of testing that happens as a result. Well, uh, it's a very competitive, uh, you know, kind of a model in, and geared right. towards the test, right? You're kind of striving to take all these tests all the time. Yeah, and I don't think that that's necessarily the best way to develop critical thinking and general knowledge about what's going on in the world to solve the kind of problems that the world is facing. So my recommendation would be that as best as much as possible for teachers to bring um, 
social current affairs, geopolitics into their classroom discussions so that kids become aware of what's going on in the world. I think that that's, that's really crucial, um, that they can't be um, blinded by their own sort of personal context, but they have to look um, more globally. I think that schools really ought to invest um, time and energy and resources into mentorship programs. I think as often as possible that kids are um, exposed to role models um, where one, they feel special and they feel heard, but also that they're exposed to, again, it's another way of being exposed to service or empathic action. So I think that's another, um, another way of approaching this. Um, career advisors need to be educated about social entrepreneurship so that they can actually highlight the industry as a domain for work. And not just social entrepreneurship, but the social economy more broadly. You know, you've got the private sector working for companies and you've got the public sector working for governments, but there's that whole social sector in the middle that's traditionally been called the nonprofit sector, but it's a lot more complicated um, and nuanced than that now. But I think career advisors need to actually promote this as a field primarily because there's so much benefit to working in the industry, not financial benefit because it's still underpaid, but the kind of um, feeling of meaning and purpose in your life that's derived from working at industry, I think that that needs to be um, celebrated. And then the last um, takeaway from my interviews was that um, there needs to be a greater emphasis on community service or service learning programs at all levels. And that um, it's not a one-off. You know, you don't do one good thing a year, but that service and service learning and what I call empathic action become fully entrenched in curriculum. Um, that's the way it's going to stick. Yeah. So it sounds like you're you're saying that okay, society has all these problems, and that um, you know you're kind of wanting to do problem solving, and how do you create a, a process for doing that? And that social entrepreneurship. Uh, is like one mechanism for solving these societal problems and that education needs to kind of uh, integrate the social entrepreneurship uh, ethos and and uh, skills and and it kind of actually promote it in and yeah. nurture it and foster it and that all, these are all kind of different ways that the education system can nurture and foster uh, the social entrepreneurship uh, movement or kind of way of being, I guess. So that's why I advocate strongly for teacher training programs, faculties of education, that they actually offer courses on social entrepreneurship and social change so that they are aware of how they could teach um, in a different way where students, you know, because it starts with teachers too, right? Teachers have to be, they, have, they deserve the professional development that would facilitate this kind of programming and curriculum. So I think that's, uh, you got it right. I mean, you're a good listener. <laughs> <laughs> that's the great thing about listening. All you do is sit and not say anything. <laughs> and the people are so thrilled, like, oh, this is such a good listener. You're so... <laughs> True. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the part of the uh, process, right? Empathic action is kind of built on those other empathic uh, uh, qualities. So we gotta, you know, set the set the framework there for it. Right. Um, so I guess after all is said and done, after doing these interviews and um, you know those insights were, I worked out those insights. Then I looked at, okay, so what is a pedagogy of empathic action really about? And I build it on three pillars, okay? The first one is critical pedagogy. And so now I'm going to go into some sort of, um, not technical words, but this is really education focused, okay? Um, stuff that we're going to talk about right now. And this so is your you chapter five, right? Introducing a pedagogy of empathic action. I'm just following along here on the outline. Okay. Exactly, exactly. So the first pillar is critical pedagogy, which really is an umbrella term that describes a process of 
human emancipation, human liberation through the process of education, okay? And it, 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 it involves exploring and dismantling power hierarchies, okay? So let me make this simple. Critical pedagogy says, let's look at society the way it is now, and let's not assume that the status quo has to be that way, okay? So critical pedagogy is about enlightening each person to say, wow, you know, I'm capable of social change and how are we collectively able to change systems? And they, they're very, it's a very political orientation where it's saying, I reject the idea that the way things are today are the way things need to be. You know, if you look since the dawn of mankind, we've gone through evolutions of change and there's no reason why we're going to stay static in the contemporary, you know, format, right? We're evolving as human beings, society's evolving. So how do we want to create a society? How do we want to change things? So that's what critical pedagogy is about. It's about change. Uh, going back to your original word. Uh, could I, so, can I say, ask something about that? Is it, would you say that that's more of a cognitive approach? It's like we've well, got a critical thinking, cognitive uh, analysis and action kind of. That's Fabulous question, um, uh, Edwin, because the grandfather of critical pedagogy is Paulo Freire, okay? He's a Brazilian educator, or he was, he passed away a few years ago, um, who basically worked at, um, he worked with peasant farmers, okay? And he was a middle-class guy, and uh, he really believed, uh, he was a bit of a Marxist, okay? There was a Marxist orientation between like sort of the bourgeoisie and the proletariat kind of um, mindset where, you know, working with the farmers that were not well educated, we have to throw off the shackles of power and we can do this self-emancipation through literacy and education, okay? That's where he's coming from. He was imprisoned for his political activities, but he was sensational, sensational thinker um, who believed in, in, in the power of love, in education and um, what is it, fraternité, I mean these really really solid ideas and his big, as far as I'm concerned, one of his big concepts is praxis, okay, which speaks to the heart of your question. Praxis is the combination of reflection and action coming together. When you have reflection and action, that's when praxis happens. So social change happens with reflection and with action. So part of critical pedagogy is those two things together. And that's what, um, you know, really is the, the basis of, of um, critical pedagogy. Okay, so, so it's reflecting, it's refl what are you reflecting? Reflecting on, on what? Just on the, the social situation or are you reflecting? Like a lot of these, you know, approaches were kind of... The, it, it, it's like you're already saying throwing off the shackles, right? I mean, there's yeah. already kind of like judgments kind of thrown in there. And it's like, you know, off with the heads of the 1% kind mm -hmm. of, uh, and there's a lot of judgment and us and them kind of. Yeah. So is it yeah. is it reflecting the judgments or is it reflecting the humanity of all people, you know? So it's, it's taking, I think, um, I mean, it, it's a very critical question that you're asking. I mean, I'm certainly paraphrasing and exaggerating, um, um, uh, his theories. And yes, he did believe that it was an us against them, um, situation. Um, but praxis at the heart of praxis, the reflection is not with judgment. The reflection is with critical lens, looking at the situation and, and really reflecting on, you know, is this the best way things can be? Um, is the situation that I'm in the only situation that I can be in or are there other opportunities? Are there other formations? Are there other possibilities? So it's an inspirational and aspirational political um, um, anchor. So I don't, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, well, it sounds like it's kind of reflection, but it's a more cerebral reflection. I mean, it's, it's, huh? It certainly is. It's looking at circumstances and imagining how things could be different and acting on how things could be different. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, that's clear. Okay. So the second pe um, pillar um, is a pedagogy of the privileged. 
Now, that's an interesting terminology because I mentioned Paulo Freire. His very famous book is Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Okay. So more recently, Anne Curry Stevens, um, a Canadian scholar who did her PhD at the Ontario Institute for so, uh, for hmm, for the so for the studies of education, OISE. Um, she's now out west. I believe she's she might even be teaching in Portland, if I'm not mistaken. She wrote her she, her research on the pedagogy of the privileged, and you know she already saw the criticism coming and said, "Listen, I don't mean to say that the privileged deserve more attention. That we should be you know emphasizing the you know providing extra service and pedagogy to the privileged." She's saying. If we do not engage the privileged in the in the fight for more social justice and more social equality, then it's going to continue to be an us versus them situation. And if you look at the Western context, most kids, most, and I'm, and there are many, many exceptions to that. But by and large, in Western society, whether it's North America or Europe, kids are born into relative privilege. The fact that they can go to school for free and that they, you know, can pursue, um, you know, their their passion or their calling—that is a position of privilege. And so, her framework is to dismantle uh, assumptions and to really question the sort of position, the relative positions of power that people in privileged positions have, and to actually inspire people who have those positions of privilege to become allies in social struggle. So, you know, people, so she's not really saying, let's make the 1% our ally, but she's saying, let's look at the 50% of the top tier of the 99%, let's make those folk are allies in social change and the struggle for social justice. So that would be the second pillar of a pedagogy for empathic action. So you've got on one hand critical pedagogy that's saying the way things are don't need to be the way things are. What can we do differently? And then the second pillar is the people who have relative privilege in society, let's make them allies in social change. So they don't feel threatened that they're going to lose through this sort of, you know, more social equality, let's actually give them an opportunity to reflect on how they can make a change and be a, um, part of the solution as opposed to part of the problem. So is that one clear? Yeah, it's, um, it's uh, trying to bring in the upper middle class uh, type of uh, part of society and say, uh, how can kind of we work together to uh, bring around bring around bring you know, problem solve and bring around more uh, equality together right. uh -huh. yeah yep okay so you got it. and then the third pillar is social justice education now a lot of these uh, labels are seen very differently in different parts of the world so social justice education in the United States tends to take um, a, a big tends to make a big focus on race relations and social justice for the different races within um, that make up the United States. Whereas in Canada and Europe, social justice has a somewhat different um, take and that's, that's the take that I have. So it's an umbrella term used to describe teaching practices that are committed to the creation of a more equitable, respectful and just world. And it holds as its core tenet the idea that every human being has intrinsic value and deserves to be treated with dignity and respect. So the, there's a range of social justice education practices that are like vast and varied, but I emphasize three of them. And in, in retrospect, I would have emphasized four of them. So, um, you know, but I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna write an addendum to my <laughs> thesis, but I, I'm happy to share with you my thoughts on it. The first one is educating for a new consciousness, um, which is, you know, very much, I guess, tied to um, spiritual, secular spiritual practices um, that who are we as individuals? Where do we come from? What do we share in common? Um, there's a lot of uh, discussion um, around um, what is consciousness and uh, I think, you know, quantum mechanics and quantum 
Um, physics is looking at what consciousness is and they're discovering some really interesting things that kind of in, you know, could be labeled woo woo, um, but that we're all one and that we're all energy fields. So, um, one of them is educating for a new consciousness, just looking at the world through a different lens, not just seeing the world as sort of like a marketplace, uh, where there's divisions around nationalities, religions, races, um, but that we're all human beings. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is global citizenship education, um, which is, you know, tearing down the boundaries of uh, arbitrary lines in, you know, across the globe where one country begins and another country ends. Um, what does global citizenship mean? You know, I'm a Canadian and I'm really concerned about our tar sands. Um, you know, we used to be at the forefront of uh, peace initiatives. Um, we, you know, we'd have our Blue Beret United Nations peacekeepers and we've really changed the direction, um, our foreign policy, our environmental um, record. Now that we um, have a, a government that is more right wing. So, the idea of educating for global citizenship is not just looking at your own community, but looking at the entire globe as the space that you inhabit. So I think that that's really important. Um, and there's a lot of good examples of how um, schools have partnered with other schools around the globe um, for dialogue, and that would be part of global citizenship education. And also, I put a little emphasis on the citizenship part, is that, um, you know, I've never been um, uh, exposed to civics education, and I'm not 100% um, advocating that we need to understand uh, the nooks and crannies of how our parliament or Congress work, although that's useful information. But the idea that we're citizens um, and that we should be contributing to the direction our country takes and the world takes at large, um, and that there are mechanisms that create laws and policies we need to be um, uh, educated citizens so that we can actually engage in the political process a little bit more. So that's part of global citizenship as well. Okay. And then finally, well, finally in my thesis, but there's another one um, I'll get to in a sec, um, is educating for sustainable development and socio-ecological justice. That's a really big part of it now is that our habitat is under siege and what's happening as a result of that is it's affecting us humans and you know all living um, forms on the planet you know when you have um, global warming and what that's doing to you know levels of sea changing and crops and and the farming system changing and major droughts and crazy kind of um, you know climate systems it's affecting human beings. And so um, social justice education is also factoring in the planet we live on and that we need a healthy planet to survive. Um, and that disproportionately uh, climate change is going to affect the poor and they don't deserve that. So that's a big part of it. I guess today, if I were rewriting my dissertation, I would add a fourth to that and that would be othering education um, and that is I mean it, it, it ties in with the others as well but this notion that we see others as so separate and distinct from us when in fact um, there's so much more that we have in common than we that then divides us so um, anti-othering education would be also very very important to social justice education yes. so um, I was just kind of what was coming if I mentioned a couple of things here uh, is um, kind of the broad framework it seems to be uh, kind of a sense of, of of disconnection and selfishness and and seeing oneself as just a, a disconnected individual and it sounds like what you're looking at is how do we kind of have more of a uh, empathic awareness that we are connected and that we need to work together and that um, these different pedagogies and, and so forth are, are ways of trying to kind of do some nuts and bolts of how do you kind of break down that sense of uh, alienation. I don't know if it's alienation, but yeah, separateness, 
uh, individuality to more of our common humanity and, and connectedness. Is that kind of a... Yeah. You're absolutely right. And, and I'll, I'll share with you something that I learned while doing this research. And it's the way our brain works and the neural pathways and, and um, neuroplasticity. So I put, when I do presentations, I usually put up a picture of um, Montreal in February when there's been a big snowfall. And uh, I take a picture of a football field with freshly fallen snow about two feet high. And so that's my first frame. Then the second frame is the footprints in the snow crossing the football field. And I say to anybody that I'm chatting with, imagine you're the first kid that's crossing the football field on your way to school in February. It's a bit of a slog, right? It's an arduous task to be the first one to stomp through the snow. Well, you live in California, so you might not have uh, expert experience with that, but it's not easy to walk through fresh fallen snow for the first time. But inevitably, the next person who comes to that football field and is going to cross, if they're a typical kid, they're going to follow in the footprints. And what will end up happening is the more people that cross over the, the, the footprints, the wider the footprints will become into a lane. And so a good example for, let's say, you know, tropical areas in California would be bike lanes, like how bicycles, you know, form, go through the grass and more people cross over it until eventually the grass erodes and it becomes a bike path, right? Same idea. And that's the way our brain works as well, is that we're kind of a clean slate when we're born and neuropathways are formed through the experiences that we have. And the more often we're exposed to something, the, the quicker uh, and, and more facilitated pathway will become. It'll become entrenched just like a bike path or the freshly fallen snow um, path. And so over time, you're exposed to behavior in your family and in your community and at schools that really, really deepen those pathways or make them really, really strong. So like, you know, a kid that's exposed to criticism all the time at home will develop sort of as a reflex defensiveness. Right, and that will become something that that he or she will have over lifetime, unless they create alternative pathways in their brain. And this is why brain plasticity is so interesting to me, and how empathy—you can actually flex an empathy muscle by practicing empathy. And so, if you're exposed to it at a young age, and you have experience with it being modeled to you, and you personally experiencing empathy and empathic action, the more um, uh, what's the word I want to say, the more habitual it will become. And the more you engage in empathic action, the better it is for you as a human organism. There's a lot of physiological medical research that shows that when you engage in service for others, your heart rate stabilizes, your immune system gets stronger, depression and anxiety go down. So there's so many benefits to you as a person and the multiplier effect of many people engaging in empathic action could really be, um, you know, the, the beginning of massive social change. So that's why I care about this issue so much. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, uh, it's that quality. Well, if, if you're kind of growing up and you're kind of being surrounded by kind of this notion of selfishness, you know, individuality, the uh, pathways in your brain are kind of uh, reinforcing that. And then there's also this sense of seeing the world, you know, our common humanity and we're all in it together. And uh, that you can kind of create the pathways in the snow, you know, for that. So it'd be kind of like a different, you need to kind of exp expand the metaphor. Like what is the, the metaphor for selfishness? Maybe it's like going in a circle or something. And then, you know, then the pathways get deepened you know, going between houses or something. So it's yeah. kind of like, you know what I mean? It's like to kind of keep within the same metaphor and then to kind of build on it and bring in those qualities of, of disconnection, kind of, or, you know, individuality versus a sense of connection. So, yeah, so is that kind of what the sense, I mean, in terms of where we can, and these are all the different methodologies, you know, having all these tools for kind of deepening those pathways for 
seeing our humanity then making it easier so we see it easier and easier yeah so i mean bottom line is neuroscience is catching up to what the mystics and sages have been saying forever and that is we are empathic beings by nature and one way that we can become more empathic is if we actually practice empathy and empathic action more often. Where can we do that? In our families, if, fam if parents are modeling that kind of behavior, or in school. So if you've got teachers that are on board and curriculum that supports empathic action, you're going to have kids that are more caring, critical about the situation that affects people disproportionately, the inequality in the world, and they might be turned on to actually wanting to do something for the betterment of all of humanity. So that's it in a nutshell, Edwin. Mm, yeah, that was, uh, how long did that take you, that thesis? <laughs> how <laughs> long was years. that? What? Seven years. Seven years, Seven. wow. That's a, so you've really been thinking about this a long time. So you've really, I, when I went through it, I thought, oh, there's a lot of work here. And there's a lot of thought and a lot of, you know, working through these ideas, so. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed uh, hearing that and kind of going through the different parts. Was that your conclusion? You had chapter seven, the conclusion. I mean, is that was that kind of what you're just saying, or was there kind of more to the conclusion? Oh, I don't have my conclusion pages in front of me, but um, I. So I, I see here you have a chapter six, which is conclusion. And do you want to go into some of what your conclusions were? Sure. In a typical dissertation, you, you, know, you need to talk about the weaknesses um, of your own uh, dissertation. I, I, I'm happy to do it, but I actually won't go into it. Um, and, and also future possible research streams, I won't go into that as well. But I want to leave you with some parting thoughts, okay? I started with a quote, and I'll end with a couple of quotes as well. This is actually Mary Gordon, um, the, the uh, founder of Roots of Empathy. This is what she says. As long as there has been strife and hunger and exploitation and cruelty, there have been visionaries, humanitarians, and people of goodwill who have advocated another life-affirming way. What is new is that we no longer have an excuse to go on inflicting pain and dividing up the Earth's resources as if the world were still a collectivity of medieval fiefdoms separated from one another by impassable mountain ranges and unknown seas. We know too much. At the touch of a button, we can see children dying from disease and famine, while we know that the medicine and food that would save them exists. At the touch of a button, we can see the victims of war and poverty, with hopelessness and suffering, while political leaders feed us what we know is diversionary rhetoric about balancing budgets and balancing power. At the touch of a button, we can visit the devastation of a country 5,000 miles away, or the mean streets of our own troubled cities, where children are hounded by bullies. Where in all the gadgetry, gadgetry of our lives is the empathy button? Where is the on switch of human responsibility that would let us feel the emotion behind what we know and impel us to stand up and take action for what we believe in? As far as I'm concerned, the on switch is the practice of empathic action. Victor Hugo famously said, there is only one thing more powerful than all the armies of the world, and that is an idea whose time has come. I'm hopeful that a large-scale adoption and diffusion of a pedagogy of empathic action would inspire an entire generation, and possibly generations to come, to work empathically and cooperatively towards positive, sustainable social change. And uh, to quote Peter Gabriel's 1987 song, Biko, you can blow out a candle, but you can't blow out a fire. Once the flame begins to catch, the wind will blow it higher. So I think the Occupy movement is actually indicative of the kind of change that the next generation wants to see. And um, I think empathic action is uh, one uh, framework to, to see that that change happens. And it sounds like you're going to be spending the rest of your life on this, maybe. You bet. You <laughs> bet. I'm working on a book. <laughs> this is my calling. Absolutely. Okay. Do you want to uh, kind of end the uh, recording recording part here? Or did you, anything else you want to say? Uh, I just want to say a personal thank you because we met at a TEDx 
compassion conference and uh, we stayed in touch very infrequently because I was busy with um, writing my dissertation and then defending in the new job and I'm glad that we've reconnected and I'm so grateful for this opportunity you know when you spend so many years working um, and you, you only really speak to the small group of committee members that read your dissertation and ask tough questions and you know friends and family you know know more or less what you're talking about but this has been the first time the first time in my life from start to finish where I've actually been able to walk through the dissertation. So I'm just, I'm incredibly grateful to you. Thank you so much, Edwin. Oh, great. I, I've enjoyed it. And I know it's nice to be heard. So it's part of the empathy part. So um, this <laughs> Doing is my great work. Well, this is my favorite topic. So it, I enjoyed kind of going through it and, uh, you know, talking about it. I could actually go on for a couple more hours because <laughs> Because we've kind of, we've done the kind of going through part. Now it's the part for defending your work. Right. <laughs> <So> <laughs> Oops, that might be. Cut off. <laughs> <laughs> because I have a lot of thoughts about, you know, and especially the whole empathic action part. You know, it's like, you know, really getting, you kind of touched on a little bit, but that's, I'm really interested in that whole, you know, you know, getting really feeling, not just seeing it out here, but kind of feeling it within myself. It's like, how does empathy, empathic action really work? You know, what's the real nuances? Because I, I think to build a culture of empathy, you know, we're really going to have to understand that as, a, as an engine for uh, action, you know, an, an engine for doing something. And, you know, what, are, what fosters that? You know, why would people want to do it? And uh, so I was really thrilled that you're kind of addressing this topic. Yeah. Well, my, my very short answer to that question is twofold. One is it either needs to be automatic. So somebody's exposed to it so often that they see it as a habitual thing and know no other way of being in the world, or it has to be a choice. And a good example that I use, um, Martin, uh, not Martin Zelligman, uh, Martin Hoffman wrote a book about empathy. And uh, he talks about the Japanese and that there's this, have you heard of co a cognitive dissonance? Uh, I've heard the term, yeah, I'm not real okay, so clear on what it means. The first time it, I was exposed to the terminology cognitive dissonance was in a marketing and consumer behavior class, where basically when you buy something that you were not 100% certain about, you're going to seek out information that validates your choice. Because if you find information that proves that you were wrong to make that purse purchase that's what cognitive dissonance is about is this sort of like anxiety around oh I did the wrong thing or I was in disalignment with what I should have done so this idea of cognitive dissonance also exists when you act in ways that are really different from what you believe is the way you would normally act or like to act mm -hmm. so Martin Hoffman talks about the Japanese that believe that they sh ought to behave in certain ways to be a good human being and that there's huge dissonance if they don't act and behave in those ways that, of consistent behavior. So the choice that we need to make is it needs to be really clear to us that we should become more empathic as human beings and act on that empathy. And if we believe that that's the kind of person that we are or should be, we will start to act in, with greater consistency. So there's choice. So it's either a human nature like that, that we do it habitually because it's been modeled to us before and we know no other way, or we decide to make, to become more empathic um, and then act in ways consistent with that way of being. Yeah. So I, I kind of uh, like the second way in the terms of there's this, this quality of if you go into a room and everybody's just kind of doing their own thing, selfish and competitive, that you kind of adapt to that environment. And you could do it without consciously. We just kind of do it kind of automatically, maybe through mirror neurons. But if I know that empathy is important to me and I have the vocabulary for it and I go into that environment, you know, I can say, hey, I'm not so I don't like the environment here. I think we need to change it. You know, and, it, and it's like this thing where you go into a whole different environment and it's very caring and empathic and and, 
you know, so I guess it's that kind of uh, consciously saying we need to transform society. So, kind of and guarantee because of mirror neurons, if you enter a toxic environment or an environment where it's not all lovey dovey, you could easily fall prey to that, you know, because you'll, you'll fit in that way. But if you're making a conscious choice to come in with a smile, to come in with a soft touch, to respect people, to engage with people in a different way, you will have an impact on the people around you. I mean, there's research that has, um, I think it's out of Princeton, and it was replicated many, many times. They had two groups of 30 people. Um, I think they were union workers trying to find a way to a solution, a mediated solution on some kind of union issue. And they hired actors, okay? I mean, big unions where not everybody knew each other, right? So these actors weren't obvious to the, to the group. And one actor, they, all, they had the same um, text, so they were saying the same words, but one actor was like, you know, bored, rolling his eyes at whatever suggestion was showing up, showing contempt. The other actor went into the room and was like, yeah, that's a good idea, and smiling uh -huh. and engaging. And they replicated this um, study many times, and the actor that came in with a smile and, uh, and showed some positive reactions, that group as a whole found a solution to this problem that they had to get mediation on, whereas the other group didn't. So one person can have a major, major impact on a group. So yeah, you can make the decision and you can challenge yourself to actually be that positive person, be that empathic person, and, and you'll have an impact. Yeah. Well, I would love to, uh, you know, talk about the kind of the details more because there's all this uh, about the, you know, the, the pedagogy for empathic action, uh, the uh, critical pedagogy and the privilege and the social justice. I have a lot of questions about that because there's already a whole uh, history uh, of that. And I'm not so uh, convinced, you know, about it being... Uh, it seems to be a lot of us and them and, and judgment and and criticism and and it kind of leaves out a lot of it leaves out the uh, the mirroring aspect of empathy right it's like and, and the mirroring em part of empathy for everyone so that there's still the idea of like with the occupy there's the one percent who are kind of the uh, you know the bad guys versus, right. you know, trying to empathize with them as well. And right. we had a, a tent here, we call it the 100% empathy tent at the Berkeley Occupy. Right. And the whole idea was it's 100% empathy for everyone. Right. And there's no us and them. And right. how can we, you know, empathize with you know, everyone and everyone empathize with everyone else. So you kind of like say, this is the kind of society that we want. Well, I would love to have a conversation with you and drill down further into each of the pillars. It would be my yeah. pleasure. Okay, well, good. I got you committed to that now. <laughs> that's the, get slammed. <laughs> that's the empathic action component. We have to. What is the action we're going to take now to continue building this uh, culture? So, um. see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world.